Secret Cities. Carl Eifler flew from Washington to London in early 1944. From there, he would make his way to Switzerland. Oppenheimer did what he could to assist, helping the OSS find recent photographs of Heisenberg. Beyond that, the German bomb project was beyond his control. All Oppenheimer could do was build his own bomb as quickly as possible. By 1944, the stress of the race was taking a visible toll. He was smoking more than ever, as much as four to five packs a day. Violent, purple-faced coughing fits punctuated his sentences. He shed more weight from his bony frame, dropping to an almost skeletal 115 pounds. And yet, somehow, the pressure was making him stronger. He spent long days pacing the tech area, popping his head into labs long enough to help solve problems, dropping into offices to join the ever-raging debates. It was clear to all of us, remembered Hans Baith, that he knew everything that was important to know about the technical problems of the laboratory, and he somehow had it well organized in his head. When he asked scientists for updates, they handed him 15 or 20 page technical papers dense with formulas and calculations. Well, he'd say, let's look this over and we'll talk about it. He'd flip through the pages for five minutes, then lead a discussion on the paper's key points. He had a remarkable ability to absorb things so rapidly, said the physicist Lee Dubridge. I don't think there was anything around the lab of any significance that Oppie wasn't fully familiar with. Each of us could walk in, sit on his desk, and tell him how we thought something could be improved, remembered Joe Hirschfelder, a chemist. We all adored and worshipped him. Robert Wilson expressed a theme echoed by many at Los Alamos. Oppenheimer inspired them to do things they didn't think they could. In his presence, I became more intelligent, Wilson said, more vocal, more intense. He brought out the best in all of us, agreed Hans Baith. Everyone worked day and night, Monday through Saturday. Oppenheimer insisted people take Sundays off to rest and recharge. Scientists fished for trout in nearby streams or climbed mountains and discussed physics while watching the sunrise. This is how many discoveries were made, one scientist said. Oppenheimer unwound by jumping on his horse, Chico, and taking long rides in the hills. Armed guards rode two steps behind. When Oppenheimer called Richard Feynman into his office, the 26-year-old Feynman must have thought he was in trouble again. Several times already, he'd been ordered to the office of the Army censors. Censors read all incoming and outgoing mail to ensure it contained no secret information. Feynman drove them crazy by having his family write to him in code. He enjoyed cracking the codes. Army censors did not. Then he found a new hobby, picking locks on file cabinets around the tech area and removing top-secret documents. Whenever I wanted somebody's report and they weren't around, confessed Matt Feynman, I'd just go into their office, open the filing cabinet, and take it out. When he was done, he'd hand the papers back to the scientists and say, Thanks for your report. Where'd you get it? they'd ask. Out of your file cabinet. But I locked it. I know you locked it. The locks are no good. This kind of stuff infuriated Leslie Groves. Here at great expense, he moaned to Oppenheimer, the government has assembled the world's largest collection of crackpots. He caused a lot of trouble, Oppenheimer's secretary said of Feynman. But, she added, Oppie made allowances. Even in a city of geniuses, Feynman's brain stood out. And now, Oppenheimer needed him for an urgent job. By 1944, Los Alamos was just one small part of the Manhattan Project. The government was also building a massive factory at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, a secret city with 80,000 workers living in trailers around the plant. It was their job to prepare the uranium for the bomb being de designed at Los Alamos. But there was a secret danger, Oppenheimer told Feynman. The Army liked to keep everything secret. So, the Oak Ridge workers knew very little about uranium and almost nothing about how to handle the stuff safely. Feynman would have to go there, inspect the factory, and help them prevent a catastrophic nuclear accident. Now, the following people are technically able down there at Oak Ridge, said Oppenheimer, naming scientists Feynman should talk to. I want you to make sure that these people are at the meeting, that you tell them how the thing can be made safe so that they really understand. What if they're not at the meeting? asked Feynman, feeling suddenly overwhelmed. What am I supposed to do? Then you should say, Los Alamos cannot accept the responsibility for the safety of the Oak Ridge plant. You mean me, Little Richard, is going to go in there and say that? Yes. Little Richard, you go in and do that. Feynman collected top-secret reports on uranium and strapped the papers to his back, under his shirt. Then, for the first time in his life, 
he boarded an airplane. I really grew up fast, he said. Feynman inspected Oak Ridge. Conditions were worse than Oppenheimer had feared. Feynman wrote up a report about the safety problems and how to solve them. The next day, the Oak Ridge directors gathered to hear his findings, but right before meeting an army cur- right before the meeting, an army colonel warned Feynman not to discuss any secret information about how the atomic bomb might work. It's impossible for them to obey a bunch of rules unless they understand how it works, objected Feynman. The colonel repeated his order. Feynman's mind flashed back to his talk with Oppenheimer. He took a deep breath and shouted, Los Alamos cannot accept responsibility for the safety of the Oak Ridge plant. The colonel was silent for a while. All right, Mr. Feynman, he said finally. Go ahead. Feynman explained the basics, how uranium atoms split when hit with neutrons, how they give off energy, how a chain reaction could lead to an explosion. It wouldn't work with just any uranium, though. The nucleus of a uranium atom usually has a total of 238 protons and neutrons. It's called U-238. When hit with a speeding neutron, U-238 does not fission. It's useless to bomb makers. But a small percentage of uranium atoms, about one out of every 130, have a total of 235 protons and neutrons. This is U-235. When U-235 is hit by neutrons, it does split and release energy. The incredibly difficult job of the Oak Ridge plant was to separate U-235 atoms from U-238 atoms, sending just the U-235 to Los Alamos. Feynman explained how much uranium could be brought together before it became dangerous and how to use cadmium to absorb neutrons and stop a chain reaction. All of this was elementary stuff at Los Alamos, he recalled, but they had never heard of any of it, so I appeared to be a tremendous genius to them. The Oak Ridge directors agreed to redesign the factory with this new information in mind. That was good, said Feynman. The plant would have blown up if nobody paid attention. Oak Ridge continued producing U-235, but very slowly. If everything went well, by the summer of 1945, they'd have enough fuel for just one atomic bomb. Determined to build a bigger arsenal, Leslie Groves ordered the construction of another secret city, this one in Hanford, Washington. The Hanford plan was based on something else scientists had learned about fission. When U-238 atoms are hit with flying neutrons, they absorb the neutrons. That is, the neutrons stick in the nucleus of the uranium. This causes the uranium to change into an entirely new element, one that doesn't occur in nature. Scientists named it plutonium. Plutonium, they discovered, will fission even faster than U-235, so it could be used for building atomic bombs. The Hanford plant was created to produce plutonium as quickly as possible. Between Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, Hanford, and other secret labs around the country, the Manhattan Project was employing more than 300,000 people. The government was spending hundreds of millions of dollars. Yet the project was so secret, President Roosevelt chose not to tell Congress where all the money was going. A senator from Missouri named Harry Truman began to get curious. I had known, Truman later said, Something was unusually important was brewing in our war plants. But what? Worried that the government was wasting taxpayer money, Truman decided to send investigators to Oak Ridge and Hanford. Hanford. Very soon after this, Truman's phone rang. It was Secretary of War Henry Stimson. I told him that I would come to his office at once, recalled Truman. He said he would rather come to see me. The 77-year-old Stimson walked into Truman's office. He lowered himself into a chair beside Truman's desk and got right to the point. Truman needed to stop asking questions about the secret war plants. Senator, said Simpson, I can't tell you what it is, but it is the greatest project in the history of the world. It is most top secret. Many of the people who are actually engaged in the work have no idea what it is, and we who do would appreciate your not going into all those plants. Well, all right then, said Truman. All right, agreed Stimson. You assure me that this is for a specific purpose? Not only for a specific purpose, corrected Stimson, but a unique purpose. I'll take you at your word, said Truman, disappointed. I'll order the investigations into those plants called off. Truman couldn't help himself, though. He continued poking around for information about where all the money was going. Truman is a nuisance, Stimson griped. But nothing the senator did changed Stimson's position. Knowledge of the atomic bomb was available on a strictly need-to-know basis. Harry Truman did not need to know. 
Man with Four Gloves. On the freezing afternoon of February 4, 1944, Harry Gold walked the streets of New York City's Lower East Side. He was wearing gloves and holding a second pair in his hand. This was according to Simon Somanoyev's directions. The gloves were a recognition signal for the man he was to meet. The other man, Gold was told, would be carrying a tennis ball. A few minutes before four, Gold turned onto Henry Street. He always tried to get to a meeting spot a little early, just to have a look. He liked what he saw. The narrow street was lined with four- and five-story brick tenement buildings, many of them in the process of being torn down and replaced. The place had been very well chosen, said Gold. It was beautifully deserted. A few blocks away, Klaus Fuchs climbed the concrete stairs of Manhattan subway station and stepped up onto the streets of the Lower East Side. He climbed out a folded map, took a quick look, and started walking. As he turned onto Henry Street, he took a tennis ball from the pocket of his long coat. This was according to Ruth Werner's instructions. Before leaving Britain, she had told him where and when to meet his American contact. She told him to carry a tennis ball and to look for a man holding an extra pair of gloves. Fuchs did not know the man's real name and was not to ask. Sure enough, as Fuchs approached the designated spot, there was a man with four gloves, pacing the sidewalk to keep warm. The man glanced at Fuchs and at the tennis ball in his hand. He stepped forward. What, what is the way to Chinatown? asked Gold. I think Chinatown closes at five o'clock, Fuchs responded. With this exchange of passwords, each knew for certain he was dealing with the right man. Gold introduced himself as Raymond. Fuchs used his real name, since there was no secret about his identity. They shook hands, then began walking together. We strolled a while and talked, Gold later reported to Semenoyev. He is about five foot ten, thin, pale complexioned, and at first was very reserved in manner. Gold suggesting they get something to eat. Folks agreed. As I kept talking about myself, reported Gold, he warmed up and began to show evidence of getting down to business. Folks told Gold he was proud to be helping the Soviet Union. He told Gold where he was living, where the British team was working, and who was on it. He described as much as he knew about the organization of the Manhattan Project, saying he'd heard that the bomb design was happening at a secret site somewhere in New Mexico. They made arrangements to meet again and agreed to a few basic rules. To avoid drawing attention, they would never meet in the same place twice, and under no circumstances, said Gold, were we to wait any longer than four or five minutes at any of the meeting places. About a month later, they met again on a Manhattan street corner and walked together toward the East River. Gold asked Fuchs for specifics about his work in America. Fuchs explained that he and the British team were working out the details of how best to separate U-235 from U-238. The actual work was being done at a factory in the southeast, the Oak Ridge plant, though Fuchs didn't know the details yet. Fuchs described some of the complex challenges in separating uranium atoms. With his experience in chemistry, Gold was able to follow the basic science. At the first opportunity, said Gold, I put this material in writing and later handed it over to John. John was a KGB agent named Anatoly Yakskov. Gold's longtime contact, Simon Semenoyev, had been under extremely close FBI surveillance lately, making it too risky for him to be closely involved with a source as valuable as Fuchs. Gold's new contact, Yakskov, worked as a clerk at the Soviet consulate in New York. Soon after receiving Gold's report, Yakskov slipped away from his desk, walked up to the KGB office on the top floor, coded the report, and sent it to Moscow. Top officials at KGB headquarters were thrilled. Finally, they had a high-level physicist inside the Manhattan Project. Just as he'd been in Britain, Fuchs was a bit of a loner in New York. He bought a violin and spent his evenings playing music in his apartment. On weekends, he enjoyed hiking on trails outside the city. Each weekday, he went to his office near Wall Street where he worked with a team of British physicists. The other scientists liked Fuchs and respected his work, but didn't pay much attention to him. No one noticed him slipping notes and handwritten drafts of technical papers, documents he would have no reason to take home, into his briefcase. I personally furnished all of the drafts, he later said, directly to the individual known to me as Raymond. Folks and Gold set a third meeting for March on Park Avenue in Manhattan. It was a chilly day, and both wore overcoats. Folks and Gold spotted each other and knew what to do. We'd immediately turned into one of the dark, deserted side streets, Gold recalled. Gold walked up behind Fuchs. Fuchs took an envelope from his overcoat pocket and passed it quickly to Gold, who dropped it inside his coat. They walked together to the next corner, then separated. 
The whole affair took possibly 30 seconds or one minute, Gold said. That was a standard tradecraft. When documents were being exchanged, meetings should be very short. Approximately 15 minutes later, said Gold, I turned over information to John. Folks and Gold met again in late March in the Bronx. While they had dinner, folks told Gold that the atomic bomb was being designed at a place called Los Alamos. At several more meetings in May and June, Fuchs delivered packages of documents with technical information on his work. Gold took the packages directly to Anatoly Yatskov. After one of his pickups from Fuchs, Gold arrived early for the handoff to Yatskov. I still had about five minutes, he said. He felt a large envelope in his pocket. Inside was information about the most closely guarded secret on earth. The temptation was too great. Gold stopped on the street in front of a drugstore. He looked all around. No one was watching. He slipped the envelope from his jacket pocket, reached in, pulled out the papers, and tilted them toward the faint light coming through the store window. He began to read. This was in very small but distinct writing, he said. It was in ink and consisted mainly of mathematical derivations. Gold didn't understand one word of it. In late July, Gold arrived at the Bell Cinema in Brooklyn for a meeting with Fuchs. Fuchs never showed. Their backup meeting was scheduled for a couple weeks later on the corner of 96th Street and Central Park West in Manhattan. Again, Gold waited. Again, no Fuchs. On this second occasion, I became very worried, said Gold. The area is very close to a section of New York where muggings often occur. Yatskov told Gold to try and find out if Fuchs was still in New York. Gold wrote Fuchs's name and address in a book and took it to the scientist's building. He was led in by a woman who was cleaning the lobby. Gold showed her the book, explaining he'd borrowed it from his friend, Klaus Fuchs, and was here to return it. Fuchs was gone, the woman said. He left town suddenly and didn't say where he was going. Gold passed the bad news to Yatskov. KGB officials in Moscow were furious. After years of frustration, they'd finally gotten a source inside the American bomb project. Now they'd lost him. A stern warning and reprimand must be made, Moscow cabled its New York office for losing contact with such a source. The Soviets never could have guessed that a second source was about to walk in the door. Born Rebel When Theodore Hall graduated high school at the age of 13, he listed his top three career options. Comedian, journalist, physicist. At just 14, Hall entered Queens College in New York City. Finding the work too easy, he transferred to Harvard, and loaded up on the toughest math and physics courses available. The challenging subjects were delightful and hot stuff, he told his brother. Physicist jumped to the top of his dream job list. Ted Hall turned 18 in 1944. He was about six feet tall and very thin, with wavy black hair. He was about to finish college and assumed he'd be drafted into the Army as soon as he graduated. The government had other plans. One afternoon, Hall was asked to report to a meeting room in the physics lab building on campus. When he walked in, he saw that the shades were drawn, the lights dim. There was a long table in the room, but only one man sat at the table. He introduced himself as a physics professor who now worked for the government in Washington, D.C. There is a project, the man told Hall. It's doing quite important work, and they need some more hands. Hall asked for a bit more detail. The man shook his head saying only that the project was war-related and top secret. After the meeting, Hall walked back to his dorm. He talked with a friend from down the hall, a fellow physics student who had also been recruited by the mysterious man from Washington. They took turns guessing what they were being asked to do and where they'd go to do it. Hall's roommate, Seville Sachs, listened to the whole conversation. Sachs was a dedicated communist, and he knew Hall had shown interest in communism as well. This turns out to be a weapon, that is really awful, Sachs said. What you should do about it is tell the Russians. Hall glared at Sachs. Sachs said nothing more. Hall rode the train to New Mexico and found his way to 109 East Palace Avenue in Santa Fe. He walked through a courtyard, knocked on a door, and entered a small office. There at a desk sat a smiling Dorothy McKibben. She made an ID badge for Hall and a quick phone call. A car came, and Hall was driven to the top of a nearby mesa and through the gates at Los Alamos. At a brief orientation, Hall was told he'd be helping to build an atomic bomb. He was given a secret little book known as the Los Alamos Primer, made up of copies of the lectures Robert Serber had given the year before. 
He got a white ID badge, giving him unrestricted access to the tech area. After spending a few days studying atomic bomb physics, all went to work with a team led by the Italian-born physicist Bruno Rossi. The team was given a tiny amount of pure U-235, one of the first samples to arrive from the Oak Ridge plant. Rossi asked Hall to carefully place the thin uranium strip inside a specially built machine that would bombard the uranium with neutrons. The more senior scientists watched while Hall worked the uranium into place. If he dropped the sample and contaminated it, they would have to wait weeks for more U-235. It wasn't the easiest gadget to work with, Hall said later. As I mounted the specimen, I remember my hands were shaking. I didn't know whether they were shaking enough for anyone else to see. Hall got the sample into place, and Rossi's machine bombarded it with neutrons. They figured out how many of the neutrons hit uranium atoms and caused fission. This was part of the process of determining exactly how much U-235 would be needed to make a uranium bomb. Impressed with his youngest team member, Rossi recommended Hall for even more important work. In the summer of 1944, Oppenheimer needed all the help he could get. A crisis that began that spring, remembered the mathematician Stanislaw Ulam. Ulam was working in his office when he heard footsteps and turned toward his open door. I saw Robert Oppenheimer running excitedly down a corridor, holding a small vial in his hand, Ulam said. Doors opened. People were summoned. Whispered conversations ensued. There was great excitement. Ulam ran into the hall and was told that Oppenheimer was holding the first samples of plutonium to arrive at Los Alamos. It was just a few grams, but it was enough to start some important experiments. The plan for the uranium bomb was to fire one lump of uranium at another inside a gun barrel. Oppenheimer scientists assumed this same gun, assembled method, would work for plutonium. But experiments proved them wrong. Fission occurred even faster than expected in plutonium, causing a chain reaction to begin more quickly than in uranium. So, in a gun assembly bomb, the chain reaction would start even before the two lumps of plutonium came completely together. Enough energy would be released to blow the plutonium apart, but only with about as much force as a normal bomb. The critical mass of plutonium would not stay together long enough to create a massive atomic explosion. The terrible shock, and an inescapable one, was that the gun assembly method could not be used for plutonium, John Manley remembered. A gun just would not assemble plutonium fast enough. What made this such a serious crisis was that Oak Ridge might be able to produce enough U-235 for one atomic bomb by the middle of 1945. If Oppenheimer was going to make more than one bomb, and Groves was demanding that he do so, the bombs would have to be made with plutonium, which was easier to produce than U-235. The bottom line, Oppenheimer now had to figure out a whole new design for an atomic bomb. The timing only added to the pressure. Allied forces landed in France in June 1944 and began battling east against French territory toward Germany. The Allies were finally winning the war, but Hitler could still turn it around by winning the race for the atomic bomb. The only way we could lose the war, said physicist Philip Morrison, was if we failed in our jobs. Still 18, Ted Hall was the youngest scientist at Los Alamos. By summer, he had learned the basics of the uranium bomb. Then, Bruno Rossi put him to work experimenting with components of the new plutonium bomb. The challenge of the top-secret work was thrilling. Living conditions are still poor here and will remain so, Hall wrote to his family, but I would be willing to live on whale blubber alone in an igloo of the South Pole for a crack at the same job. Hall felt relaxed enough at Los Alamos to be himself, which meant doing things his own way. Late one night, a fellow physicist came into Hall's office to look for some papers. He saw a 10-foot-high stack of crates in the middle of the room. On top of the leaning tower sat Hall, cross-legged, lost in thought. He was interested in tweaking the system, said one scientist. He was a natural-born rebel. On Sundays, Hall sometimes went on hikes or played a little ping-pong, but he spent most of his time off lying on the bed in his tiny room, listening to classical music and thinking and not about science. I shared the general sympathy for our allies, the Soviet Union, Hall explained. After they were attacked, everybody knew that they were bearing the main load in the fight against Nazi Germany. It looked like the Germans would be defeated, but what then? Hall tried to imagine what the post-war world would be like. 
I shared a common belief that the horrors of war would bring our various leaders to their senses and usher in a period of peace and harmony, Hall said. But what if this didn't happen? What if Americans succeeded in building atomic bombs and they were the only ones to have them? Would the United States be more likely to use atomic bombs, knowing no one else could strike back? Wouldn't the world be safer if a second major power also knew how to build atomic bombs? That way, neither country would use the bomb, knowing they'd have the bomb used on them. It seemed to me, Hall said, that an American monopoly was dangerous and should be prevented. Looking back at his younger self, Hall would later call himself a rather arrogant teenager. That helps explain why he decided to change the course of history. My decision about contacting the Soviets was a gradual one, he said, and it was entirely my own. Two inside. In mid-October 1944, Ted Hall left Los Alamos and took the train home for two weeks of leave. He celebrated his 19th birthday with his parents in New York City. The next day, October 21st, Hall went to visit Saville Sachs, his former college roommate. Ted found Sachs at Sachs's mother's small Manhattan apartment. While his mother ironed in one room, Sachs led Hall to another and closed the door. In hushed voices, Hall told his friend about his decision. But, Hall wondered, how does one go about handling, handing military secrets to the Soviet Union? Sachs had no idea. They talked over options and made a plan. Later that day, Hall walked to the offices of a company called Amtorg, a Soviet import-export business. This was the company KGB's agent Semon Semenoyev had worked for. Many of Amtorg's employees doubled as Soviet spies. Hall didn't know this. It just seemed like a good place to start. Hall entered the building and found himself in a warehouse. He saw a worker stacking boxes and approached him. I want to speak to someone about an important military issue, Hall said. The worker knew the FBI kept watch on the building, he told Hall to leave immediately. Hall persisted, asking if there was someone else he could talk to. The man quickly gave Hall a name, Sergei Kurnikov, along with a phone number. Then he turned back to his boxes. Hall recognized Kurnikov's name. He was a Soviet journalist based in New York. Hall had read his articles. Was he also a secret agent for the KGB? Hall didn't know, but at least it was a lead. Hall called the number. Kurnikov invited the young man to drop by his apartment. The next day, Hall and Kurnikov sat in the Soviet journalist's living room. As soon as Hall began talking, Kurnikov realized his young guest had an exceptionally keen mind. The young man was also clearly nervous, making aimless small talk and biting his nails. Kurnikov filled two small glasses with vodka. Hall downed his drink. Kurnikov poured him another. T.H. is 19 years old. Kurnikov reported to his KGB contact in New York. Kurnikov was, in fact, a spy. Pale and slightly pimply-faced, carelessly dressed, you can tell his boots haven't been cleaned in a long time. His socks are bunched up around the ankles. Beginning to relax, Hall turned the conversation to Los Alamos. He was working there, he told Kurnikov, alongside some of the world's most famous scientists. They were trying to build a secret weapon. Kurnikov listened asking himself, can this pimply kid really be a physicist? Does he really have access to top-secret information? Reaching for a pile of newspaper clippings, Kurnikov showed Hall an article about a new type of missile being developed by the United States. He asked if this was what Hall was working on. No, Hall said. It's much worse than that. Kurnikov told him to continue. Hall said he was helping to build an atomic bomb. He was starting to explain its destructive power when Kurnikov cut him off. Do you understand what you are doing? Kurnikov demanded. What makes you think you should reveal the USA's secrets for the USSR's sake? The Soviet Union is the only country that can be trusted with such a terrible thing, said Hall. But since we can't take it away from other countries, the USR, USSR ought to be aware of its existence and stay abreast of the progress of experiments and construction. Well, said Kurnikov, how do we know that you are not just an agent of the U.S. government trying to trap me? You don't. Why don't you just write your ideas, or whatever you want to tell us, and give it to me? I've already done that. Hall pulled out a folder and handed it to Kurnikov. Inside was what Kurnikov described as a neatly written report, outlining the basic scientific principles of the atomic bomb. 
Show this to any physicist, Hall said, pointing to the papers. He'll understand what it's all about. Hernikoff still couldn't figure out if he was being set up by the FBI or handed the gift of a lifetime. He stepped into the next room and asked his wife to go outside and check for signs that the building was being watched. She walked around the block, seeing nothing to make her suspicious. Hernikoff decided the potential payoff was worth the risk. He took Hall's folder, promising to check into everything and get back to Hall very soon. Yet Hall explained he'd be leaving in three days for Los Alamos, and once there, would be nearly impossible to reach. Army censors read the mail and listened to the phone calls. Maybe they could use his friend Saville Sachs as a courier, Hall suggested. Then he left. Grenikoff handed Hall's folder to his wife. He put on his coat, stepped into the street, and started to walk. If American agents were watching the building, he figured, they'd follow him. A few minutes later, his wife walked out of the building with Hall's folder in her purse. On his last day in New York, Hall went to lunch with his father and then to the Penn Station to catch his train. He was standing in the busy station chatting with his dad when he noticed someone watching him. It was Sergei Kurnikov. He walked to Kurnikov. They lowered their voices. Their lowered voices were drowned out by surrounding conversations and the echo of footsteps on marble flo floors. Hall's offer to provide information had been accepted by the KGB, Kurnikov said. Saville Sachs would act as a courier between Hall and the Soviets. Hall boarded his train and headed west. His neatly written report headed east to Moscow. The KGB's chief of foreign intelligence, Pavel Fitton, said Hall's inf information is of great interest to us. That was a massive understatement. Top Soviet officials like Fitkin lived in terror of Joseph Stalin. Anyone who angered or disappointed the Soviet dictator could wind up in a Siberian prison camp or with a bullet in his brain. Now, after years of agonizing frustration, Fitton could boast of having a physicist not just inside the Manhattan Project, but inside Los Alamos itself. It was pure luck, but he'd take it. Meanwhile, Harry Gold and his KGB agent, Anatoly Yatskov, were still looking for Klaus Fuchs. Our principal trouble, Gold later said, was to decide whether Klaus, for some reason, was unable to keep the meetings if he was still in New York, or whether he had actually left New York. From the KGB offices in Moscow, Yatskov learned that Fuchs had a sister named Kritzel Heinemann living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She was a communist and knew her brother was in touch with the Soviets. If a Soviet agent ever needed to reach Fuchs, secret passwords had been arranged by which the agent could make himself known to Heinemann. In early November, Gold took the bus to Cambridge and found Heinemann's house. He rang the front doorbell. The door was opened, Gold recalled, Gold recalled, by an exceedingly beautiful woman. I bring you greetings from Max, said Gold. Oh, Crystal Heinemann responded. I heard Max had twins. Yes, seven days ago. Now, Heinemann knew her visitor had come from the Soviets. She invited Gold inside and introduced him to her three young children. Gold asked if she knew where her brother was. Yes, she said. He had been transferred somewhere in the southwest United States. He'd be in Cambridge for a visit sometime around Christmas. So I can see him then, Gold reported to Yatskov. I was so overjoyed that I stayed for lunch. The moment he'd heard Southwest United States, Gold figured Fuchs must be at Los Alamos. He was right. When Oppenheimer realized he needed to design a new type of plutonium bomb, he'd called for extra help. Fuchs and the British team had moved from New York to Los Alamos in August 1944. Once there, Fuchs was unable to contact Gold, knowing the army listened to phone calls and read the mail. But he knew the Soviets. He knew they would find him. Fuchs got to work and quickly became a valuable member of the Los Alamos team. He worked days and nights, Hans Baith would later say. He contributed very greatly to the success of the Los Alamos project. Fuchs was given a tiny tech area office overlooking a pond. He got there before 8 every morning and stayed late into the night. At lunchtime, he stood at the pond feeding ducks alone. He's all ears and no mouth, a fellow Los Alamos physicist complained. You talk about your work to him, but you never feel he's giving you anything back. After work, Fuchs walked back to his room in bachelor dormitory number 102. The wife of an Italian physicist used to watch him march slowly past their window, his pale, owlish face turned down toward the muddy path. She named him Poverino the pitiful one. In the dorm, Fuchs' only visitor was the scientist in the adjoining room, Richard Feynman. 
they often sat up late together, folks smoking, Feynman sipping orange juice. Klaus, Feynman teased, you're missing a lot of fun in life. In spite of folks' reserve, people liked him. He seemed so gentle and generous. Women often asked him to babysit on Saturday nights, and folks always agreed. He put the kids to bed, then sat up and read, listening to classical music. And folks did open up a bit over time. He bought a beat-up blue, blue Buick and gave people rides into Santa Fe. He tagged along on hikes and picnics. And one late-night party, he stunned everyone by downing a bottle of whiskey and leading a conga line. Then he excused himself politely, stepped behind the bar, and passed out. Friends tucked a sheet over him and went on with the party. In the course of this work, I began naturally to form bonds of personal friendship, folks later said. I had to conceal from them my inner thoughts. The solution, he explained, was to establish two separate compartments in his mind. One compartment in which I allowed myself to make friendships, to have personal relationships, to help people, and to be in all personal ways the kind of man I wanted to be. This is the folks people saw. They sensed there was something more, something beneath the surface. No one guessed it was Fuchs's second compartment, the one he used for his secret mission. Everyone thought of him as a quiet, industrious man who would do just about anything he could to help our project, Hans Baith said. If he was a spy, he played his role beautifully. Part 4. Final Assembly The Pilot Late in the summer of 1944, at the Alamogordo Air Force Base in New Mexico, a fighter pilot named Paul Tibbetts got a strange phone call from his father in Miami. Are you in some kind of trouble, son? His father asked. Tibbetts could hear the concern in his father's, father's voice. Not that I know of, he answered. What makes you think so? Well, his father began, sounding unsure of whether or not to continue. I hear some investigators. I think they're from the FBI. I've been down here asking questions about you. Tibbetts assured his father it was just a routine check, but he knew better. This was not normal. Twenty-nine years old, Colonel Paul Tibbetts was an experienced pilot who'd flown combat missions over Europe and North Africa. Now, he was back in the States working as a test pilot, helping engineers design a new B-29 bomber. He was one of the best flyers in the country, so we couldn't help but wonder, what exactly have I done wrong? The mystery intensified a few days later when he got another call, this one from Air Force General Yuzal Ent, telling him to report right away to Ent's office in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He told me to pack my bags, Tibbetts recalled. I would not be returning. Tibbetts flew to Colorado and walked into Ent's headquarters the next morning. He was met by Colonel John Lansdale of Army Counterintelligence. Lansdale led Tibbet Tibbetts into a small side office. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions before we go in to see General Ent, said Lansdale. Without explaining his purpose, he began talking about my personal history, remembered Tibbetts. His couple of questions stretched into an interrogation from which I soon discovered that he knew more about me than I could possibly remember about myself. Have you ever been arrested? Lansdale finally asked. Tibbetts' mind raced back ten years to a night on a beach in Florida. He and his girlfriend had driven to a dark spot and climbed into the back seat. A while later, they were startled by the sudden glare of a policeman's flashlight. Could Lansdale really know about that? He must, figured Tibbetts. He knows about everything else. Tibbetts decided to tell Lansdale the story. Lansdale listened without comment. Then he stood and said, Now, let's go and see General Ent. Tibbetts followed Lansdale into Ent's office, where the general sat at his desk. There were two other men there, a naval officer and a man in a suit. Ent introduced Tibbetts to Navy Captain William Parsons and Dr. Norman Ramsey, a professor of physics. I'm well satisfied with Colonel Tibbetts, Lansdale announced. That's good, said Ent. I felt sure you would be. Then he told Abbotts he had been chosen for a vital Tibbetts he'd been chosen for a vital mission, a top secret mission. And everything Tibbetts was about to hear, Ent cautioned, would have to be concealed, even from his wife, even from the pilots and crews who would be working under him. Then Ent turned to Professor Ramsey, saying, Now you take over. Ramsey asked Tibbetts, Did you ever hear of atomic energy? Oppenheimer's scientists had not yet built an atomic bomb. It was far from certain they could. But U.S. military planners had to think ahead. If a bomb were built in time to affect the outcome of the war, it would need to be dropped by a plane. A pilot needed to be chosen and given special training. 
Paul Tibbetts got the job. Tibbetts learned the basics of how the atomic bomb would work and approximately how powerful the explosion might be. Using this information, it was his task to devise a strategy for flying the bomb over enemy territory, releasing it on target, and getting away before the massive blast killed everyone on the plane. Given the freedom to pick his own training site, Tibbet selected a base in Wendover, Utah, a remote spot surrounded by salt flats. There was no place nearby for fun-loving men with six-hour passes to get into trouble and possibly leak information, explained Tibbetts. Then, Tibbetts chose his flight crews, handpicking many of the men he'd flown with earlier in the war. He wouldn't tell them what their new mission was and warned them never to ask. We don't want them even to speculate, said Tibbetts, or to give out a hint that our operation was different from any other. Known as the 509th Composite Group, Tibbetts' mysterious team was officially activated on December 17, 1944. At the age of 29, I'd been entrusted with the successful delivery of the most frightful weapon ever devised, Tibbetts recalled. Although the weapon was beyond my comprehension, there was nothing about flying an airplane that I did not understand. If this bomb could be carried in an airplane, I could do the job. Swiss Deal Carl Eifler stood on the balcony of the Office of the Strategic Services Office in the city of Algiers, Algeria. Loud honks and shouts rose from the hectic street below. OSS Director General William Donovan stepped onto the balcony. He closed the door behind him. Eifler had spent the past few months perfecting his plan to kidnap the German physicist Werner Heisenberg and putting together his team for the job. Everything was set, he told Donovan, for my proposed entry into Country X. Carl, there's a change in your orders, Donovan informed Eifler. We've broken the atom secret with our Manhattan Project. We beat the Nazis. Your mission is scrubbed. I see, sir, said Eifler, blinking back tears of disappointment. Donovan assured Eifler he'd be given a new assignment, one just as dangerous, penetrating Japanese-held territory in Korea. Eifler walked back to the room he was sharing with another OSS operative. Unable to sleep that night, he paced the room, muttering, Can't get him out of my mind. I can't get him out of my mind. Who? asked the other man, annoyed at being kept awake. The last guy I bumped off, said Eifler. Well, the roommate yawned, what can you do about it? Bump off another one? Oh, for heaven's sake, Carl, turn out the light and go to bed. Donovan had not been truthful with Eifler. The Americans had not yet broken the atomic secret and did not know if they would beat the Nazis to the atomic bomb. Donovan just wanted to take Eifler off the job without hurting the man's feelings. But the job was still on. By December 1944, American and British forces were driving toward Germany from the west. The Soviets were coming on fast from the east. Hitler was about to be crushed, unless he could pull out an atomic bomb. So it was still necessary, reasoned Donovan, to target German physicists, especially Heisenberg. But Donovan had changed his mind about Eifler's fitness for the mission, worried the man's loose cannon style could draw unwanted attention to the delicate operation. He gave the job instead to a 41-year-old former baseball player named Mo Berg. Berg had been a mediocre ball player at best, hitting 243 over 15 big league seasons as a catch-up ca backup catcher. To Berg, baseball had just been a way to make a living. In the offseason, he worked as a lawyer, studying languages, and traveled the world. In 1943, his playing days over, he took his talents to the OSS. Berg was soon assigned to a secret operation, codenamed ALSOS. The ALSOS mission, mission's job, was to follow close behind advancing Allied forces in Europe, searching for any scraps of information about the German atomic bomb program. Berg spent some time in London studying atomic physics. In early December, he was told to report to Paris. Walking the streets, he was spotted by a sports writer he knew from a previous career. The man smiled with surprise and opened his mouth to speak. Don't ask me what I'm doing here, Berg warned. Actually, he didn't know himself. He found out the next day at a meeting with Ritz, at the Ritz Hotel with Samuel Goutsmit, a physicist who was the scientific head of the Alsos mission. Goutsmit told Berg, that based on reliable information coming out of Germany, Werner Heisenberg would be leaving the country on or about December 15th, traveling to Switzerland for a scientific conference. He would be giving a lecture at Zurich University on December 18th. Berg, explained Goutsmith, would be there too. Nothing spelled out, Berg wrote in his notes. 
but Heisenberg must be rendered hors de combat, French for out for the battle. What exactly was Berg being ordered to do? Neither he nor Goudsmit ever talked publicly about the secret mission, referred to in OSS documents as the Swiss deal. But after the war, Berg confided in a fellow secret agent, Earl Brody. He'd been drilled in physics to listen for certain things, Brody explained. If anything Heisenberg said convinced Berg the Germans were close to a bomb, then his job was to shoot him right there in the auditorium. It probably would have cost Berg his life. There would have been no way to escape. With his dark complexion and a gift for languages, Mo Berg had the ability to pass for a number of nationalities. On one earlier assignment, he'd been a French merchant, and not on another, an Arab businessman. On the afternoon of December 18, 1944, in Zurich, Switzerland, Berg was a Swiss student, curious to hear a lecture by the great German physicist Werner Heisenberg. He found the building where Heisenberg was scheduled to talk, entered, located the correct room, and hung his hat and coat in the hall. He walked into the room holding a notebook in his hand. Tucked in one pocket was a pistol. In another was a cyanide tablet, in case he needed to kill himself before being captured. Berg looked around the small lecture hall. There were about 20 people in the room, most of them professors or graduate students. The room was freezing due to wartime fuel shortages. Berg sat in the second row. Heisenberg opened by explaining the, comp the basics of complex mathematical theory called S-matrix, quickly filling the blackboard with a jumble of symbols and formulas. Berg was instantly lost. Don't trouble yourself, called the professor in the front row. We all know that. So Heisenberg moved on to an even more advanced description of S-matrix theory. Unable to follow Heisenberg's math, Berg focused on the man. Finish, Berg wrote in his notebook. Heavy eyebrows. Sinister eyes. Heisenberg paced as he spoke, a piece of chalk in his right hand, his left hand buried in his jacket pocket for warmth. He noticed a man in the second row staring at him. H likes my interest in his lecture, Berg jotted. If he heard anything that led him to believe Heisenberg was close to developing an atom bomb, Berg's orders were to take the man hors de combat. He was prepared to do so, but as far as Berg could make out, Heisenberg was talking about a completely different subject. As I listen, I am uncertain what to do, wrote Berg. If they knew what I am thinking... Heisenberg entered the lecture, and the other professors and students began discussing his theories. Berg's pistol stayed in his pocket. It was still there a few days later when Berg showed up at a dinner party at a physics professor's house in Zurich. He spotted Heisenberg inside, surrounded by party guests. Talk turned from science to the war, and several of the guests started grilling Heisenberg, demanding to know how he could live and work under Hitler, a monster who enslaved countries, murdered Jews. I'm not a Nazi, said Heisenberg defensively, but a German. Now you have to admit, one guest challenged, that the war is lost. Yes, Heisenberg sighed, but it would have been so good if we had won. Many of the guests were disgusted by this, but Berg was glad to hear of it. If the Germans were about to finish an atomic bomb, would Heisenberg really believe the war was lost? Heisenberg grabbed his coat and headed for the door. Berg followed close behind, catching up to Heisenberg outside. He introduced himself as a Swiss student, and they walked together, chatting in German. The narrow streets were dark and quiet. There was no one around. It was the perfect moment to kill Heisenberg. But Berg had no evidence that the man really presented a threat to the Allies. Oh, it's so boring here in Switzerland, Berg said, trying to draw Heisenberg into a political discussion. Berg said he'd rather be in Germany, fighting in the war. Heisenberg disagreed politely. He said goodnight and walked into his hotel. The next day, he left for Germany. Berg wrote up his report on the mission and sent it to the OSS. Heisenberg's belief that Germany was, would lose was another piece of evidence suggesting that Hitler was not about to unleash atomic bombs. But it was not conclusive evidence. Heisenberg and the other German scientists were still in Germany, where fission had been discovered. They were still working, but on what? If only we could get a hold of a German atomic physicist, said Samuel Goutsmit, we would soon find out what the rest of them were up to. Implosion One night in late December 1944, Ted Hall sat alone in his room at Los Alamos writing a letter. 
Beside him on the desk lay an open copy of Walt Whitman's famous book of poems, Leaves of Grass. Hall carefully copied a line of poetry into his letter. The letter was addressed to Hall's friend, Saville Sachs, who would take the message to Soviet agents in New York City. Back in New York, Hall and Sachs had agreed to a set meeting date using what's known in tradecraft as the book code. Each had an identical copy of Leaves of Grass. When Hall copied a line of poetry into his letter, Sachs would find the line in his book. He'd taken careful note of the line number and then checked the table of contents to see how many poems had come before this one. These details gave the date of the meeting. If the passage, for example, was from the 12th line on the page, Sachs would meet Hall in December, the 12th month of the year. If the passage was from the 20th poem in the book, the meeting would be on the 20th day of the month. The time of day and location had been agreed upon ahead of time. Army censors can read Hall's letter, uh, read Hall's letter and pass it on to the post office. They had no reason to suspect its true purpose. When Sachs got the letter, he went to the main branch of the New York Public Library and took out a catalog listing courses offered at the University of New Mexico. He was thinking of studying there, he told friends, and was preparing for a visit to the campus. With this credible alibi in place, he bought a ticket for a three-day cross-country bus ride. Sachs arrived in Albuquerque and walked to the appointed meeting spot. I was just arriving from the opposite direction, and together they turned down a quieter street. Sachs reached into his shoe and pulled out a piece of paper, a technical question from Soviet scientists. Hall handed Sachs two pages of handwritten pages, everything he learned about the plutonium bomb so far. Back in his hotel room, Sachs copied Hall's notes onto a newspaper using milk for ink. Milk makes good invisible ink because once it dries, it can't be seen unless the paper is heated. He burned Hall's handwritten pages, tucked the newspaper into his travel bag, and got on a bus headed back to New York. In February 1945, American forces crossed the Rhine River and began slicing into Germany. Samuel Goutsmit and the Alsos team followed right behind. In the city of Haldelberg, Goutsmit cornered a physicist named Walter Bauth, a man he'd known before the war. I'm glad to have someone here to talk physics with, Bauth said, smiling and shaking Goutsmit's hand. He began telling Goutsmit about some interesting research he'd been doing. Tell me, Goutsmit cut in, how much did your laboratory contribute to war problems? Bout's expression exchanged from friendly to nervous. We are still at war, Bout said. It must be clear to you that I cannot tell you anything which I promise to keep secret. I understand your reluctance to talk, said Goutsmit, but I should appreciate it if you will show me whatever secret papers you may have. I have no such papers. I've burned all secret documents. I was ordered to do so. Goutsmith didn't buy it. The fear of a at German atomic bomb development superior to ours still dominated our thinking, he said later. And as we had obtained no real information of their uranium project in all our investigations so far, we were still mighty uneasy. The Alsos team learned that Werner Heisenberg, and whatever work he was doing, had recently been moved to a town called Heigerlock. Goutsmit only had one option. We had to go farther into Germany. At Los Alamos, Robert Oppenheimer was still losing weight. He hurried around the lab with an anxious, distracted look, sometimes not even noticing when people stopped to greet him. His scientists were wrestling with the challenge of building a plutonium bomb. Since firing two pieces of plutonium together inside a gun was too slow, the only solution, they reluctantly decided, was to blast the pieces of plutonium together with explosives, a process known as implosion. Basically, the idea was to take several pieces of plutonium, about the size of a grapefruit altogether, explosives would be arranged around the plutonium, like a very thick skin around a fruit. The explosives would blast the plutonium together at tremendous speed, creating a critical mass and setting off a chain reaction, and an atomic explosion. It was a nice theory, but scientists doubted it would actually work. For an implosion bomb to succeed, the inward blast had to be perfectly symmetrical, that is, the force driving the pieces of plutonium together had to be exactly the same from every angle. One scientist suggested a comparison. Imagine surrounding an unopened beer can with explosives and trying to blow the can in on itself without spilling a drop of liquid. That was the challenge of implosion. If the shock waves moving in on the plutonium were not perfectly even, some plutonium would squirt out instead of being driven in. A critical mass could not be achieved and the bomb would fizzle. 
Oppenheimer reorganized the entire lab, assigning everyone available to various aspects of the implosion puzzle. He gave the hardest job, that of figuring out how to create a perfectly symmetrical explosion, to a chemistry professor named George Kisowowski, Kisty for short. Kisty's first reaction? Dr. Oppenheimer is mad to think that this thing will make a bomb. Then he got to work. Kisty quickly realized that he would need to mold his own plastic explosives. His design called for a hundred or so pieces, he explained, which had to fit together to within a precision of a few thousandths of an inch. Each piece would have to explode at the exact same time, within one millionth of a second, or the bomb would fizzle. Getting implosion right required a lot of trial and error. That put Ted Hall on the center of the action. Hall's new job was to help figure out what happened to a ball of metal when it was surrounded by explosives and blown inward. Working in a small wooden cabin, he assembled test bomb cores that were about the size of a basketball. He hung each heavy core from the ceiling, made a series of measurements, then took the core down. Twice, I dropped the damn object on my toe, Hall recalled. I did it once and everyone was sympathetic, and then I did it again. Hall and a team of scientists took the core to a cannon a couple of miles from the lab. They ringed it with explosives, ducked behind a shelter, and set off the bombs. Hall then took the bomb core back to his cabin, hung it up again, and performed more tests. The results helped convince Oppenheimer that a plutonium implosion bomb might work. There were hundreds of details to hammer out, but the basic design was set. Now we have our bomb, Oppenheimer told Leslie Groves in late February. Very few people knew more about it than Ted Hall. In New York City, Savile Sachs delivered Hall's report to his KGB contact, Anatoly Yadskov. The information was cabled to headquarters in Moscow, who reported that the technical details were of great interest. But Hall's report also caused concern. Soviet spies worried they were being given disinformation. Was Hall really an American double agent, feeding false data to the Soviets in order to make them waste their time and resources on bomb designs that wouldn't work? This is what Stalin's dreaded head of secret police, Lavendry Beria, suspected. If this is disinformation, Beria warned the KGB chiefs, I'll put you in the cellar. To save their jobs, and probably their lives, Soviet spies needed a second source to corroborate Hall's report. They needed Klaus Fuchs. On a snowy February morning, Harry Gold was at home in Philadelphia getting ready for work when he got a phone call from John, the name by which he knew Anatoly Yadskov. Yadskov was at a nearby gas station and he'd see Gold right away. Gold bundled up, left the house, and found Yadskov in the station, wet and freezing. They hopped on a streetcar and talked just loud enough to hear each other over the car's clanking wheels. Yadskov's message was short and to the point. Fuchs was in Cambridge. Gold was to go see him right away. Gold jumped off the streetcar. He traveled to Massachusetts on February 21st and found Fuchs at his sister's home. Kay welcomed me most warmly, Gold later reported. Fuchs led Gold to an upstairs bedroom. He explained that he'd been unable to get away at Christmas as planned. Things were just too busy at Los Alamos. Then he gave Gold a packet of papers, a report, Fuchs later said, summarizing the whole problem of making an atomic bomb. The papers, he said, included a statement on the special difficulties that would have to be overcome in making a plutonium bomb. Fuchs explained that he wouldn't be able to get another leave from Los Alamos. Everyone was needed for the final push to finish the bomb. Future meetings would have to be in Santa Fe. He unfolded a street map of the city and showed Gold the Castillo Street Bridge. They would meet there, said Fuchs, on the first Sunday in June at exactly 4 o'clock p.m. On directions from Yatskov, Gold tried to hand Fuchs an envelope with $1,500 in tens and twenties. Fuchs brushed the money aside. It was quite obvious that, by even mentioning this, I had offended the man, Gold reported. He flatly refused to accept it. Gold apologized, picked up the money and papers, and left. When Fuchs's report reached Laboratory No. 2 near Moscow, it was read eagerly by Igor Kurchatov, lead physicist of Stalin's atomic bomb program. Though Hall and Fuchs, through Hall and Fuchs, Kurkutatov learned that a gun assembly bomb with plutonium would not work. This saved the Soviets from going down the same dead end as Oppenheimer's team. Kurkutatov also learned that it might be possible to build bombs using the principle of implosion. Very valuable, 
Kirchhoff said of the material provided by the KGB, exceptional importance. There is no doubt, he added, that the implosion method is of great interest. Falling Stars On the afternoon of April 12, 1945, Vice President Harry Truman strode through the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., dressed in his usual gray suit and bow tie. Until about a year before, Truman had been a senator from Missouri. Then, President Roosevelt surprised the nation by picking Truman to be his running mate in the 1944 election. They won easily, but Truman soon realized that FDR had wanted him to help win votes in the Midwest, not to help run the country. By April 1945, Truman had been vice president for three months. Roosevelt had invited him to a total of two private talks. At about five that afternoon, Truman stepped into the office of the Speaker of the House for a scheduled meeting. The secretary looked up from her desk. Steve Early wants you to call him right away, she said. Truman picked up the phone and dialed the number for Roosevelt's private secretary. This is the VP, Truman told Early. Please come right over. Something in the tone of Early's voice caused the blood to drain from Truman's face. Jesus Christ and General Jackson, he said as he hung up. Truman jumped in a car and told the driver to take him to the White House. I thought I was going down there to meet the president, he later said. I didn't allow myself to think anything else. But he suspected the worst. Roosevelt had not been looking well. His eyes were sunken, Truman remembered. His magnificent smile was missing from his careworn face. He seemed a spent man. Truman hurried into the White House and was taken up to the second floor to an office used by Eleanor Roosevelt, the president's wife. Eleanor stepped forward and put her arm around Truman's shoulder. Harry, she said, the president is dead. Truman stood silent for a long moment. He finally managed to ask, is there anything I can do for you? Eleanor smiled sadly at Truman. Is there anything we can do for you? For you are the one in trouble now. Truman called the members of Roosevelt's cabinet, told them the news, and asked them to come right to the White House. Then he called Harlan Fisk Stone, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He asked Stone to come swear him in as president. After taking the oath of office, Truman met with the cabinet members. He assured them he would continue Roosevelt's policies. I made it clear, however, that I would be president in my own right, he said later, and that I would assume full responsibilities for such decisions as had to be made. The meeting lasted just a few minutes. Truman watched everyone get up and silently file out. Everyone except Secretary of War Henry Stimson, who walked around the long table to, and up to the new president. Stimson told me that he wanted me to know about an immense project that was underway, a project looking to the development of a new explosive of almost unbelievable power, recalled Truman. It was the first bit of information that had come to me about the atomic bomb. Just two years before, Stimson had decided Truman wasn't important enough to know about the Manhattan Project. Now, if an atomic bomb could be built, it would be Truman's job to decide how to use it. If you ever pray, pray for me now, Truman told reporters when they surrounded him the following day. I don't know whether you fellows ever had a load of hay fall on you, but when they told me yesterday what had happened, I felt like the moon, the stars, and all the planets had fallen on me. By April, Hitler's armies were in complete collapse. Allied forces were pouring into Germany from east and west. But the question remained, how close was Hitler to getting an atomic bomb? On April 23rd, a squad of Alsos mission soldiers led by Lieutenant Colonel Boris Pasch, the same man who had grilled Oppenheimer about his loyalty to America, raced ahead of advancing armies into the town of Hagerlock. As we approached, reported Pasch, Pillowcases, sheets, towels, and other white articles attached to flagpoles, broomsticks, and window shutters flew the message of surrender. But Pash wasn't there to take the town. He was there to find Heisenberg's secret lab. The search led to an 80-foot cliff, where Pash found a doorway carved into the rock. The steel door was padlocked. Pash's soldiers asked around, found a lab manager, and dragged him to the door. Pash told the man to unlock the lab. The man hesitated. Shoot the lock off, Pash ordered his soldiers. Gesturing to the manager, he added, If he gets in the way, shoot him. The manager unlocked the door. The doorway opened into a dark cave. In the floor, dug into the rock, was a hole about ten feet across, covered by a heavy metal shield. Pash had picked up enough physics to know 
It was looking at the heart of Germany's atomic research. A German prisoner, reported Pash, confirmed the fact that we had captured the Nazi uranium machine, as the Germans called it, actually an atomic pile. In this cave, Heisenberg had been trying to build an atomic pile, similar to the one made by Enrico Fermi on the squash court in Chicago. He'd been trying to create a chain reaction in uranium, the first step on the road to an atomic bomb. But where Fermi had succeeded, Heisenberg had failed. The Germans were more than two years behind. German physicist Kurt Diebner, a leader of Hitler's bomb project, later explained why. It was the elimination of German heavy water production in Norway that was the main factor in our failure to achieve a self-sustaining atomic reactor before the war ended. The pieces of the puzzle were beginning to fall into place at last, said a relieved Leslie Groves. American soldiers found Germany's entire supply of uranium at a nearby farm, freshly plowed under the soil. It was packed into fruit barrels and shipped to the United States. The capture of this material, Groves reported, would seem to remove definitely any possibility of the Germans making any use of an atomic bomb in this war. That race was over, but another was just beginning. Germany did not have the atomic bomb. Now, Groves was determined to keep the Soviet Union from getting it. Our principal concern, he explained, was to keep information and atomic scientists from falling into the hands of the Russians. Also's teams rounded up the top German scientists. Otto Hahn, the man who had discovered fission, was sitting at a desk in his office, a packed suitcase beside him. I've been expecting you, he said in English. A few days later, Boris Pasch tracked down Werner Heisenberg in a mountainside cabin. When the Americans arrived, Heisenberg was sitting on the porch, waiting. He sighed and stood, feeling, he later said, like an utterly exhausted swimmer setting foot on firm land. He was worth more to us than ten divisions of Germans, said Groves. He had, fought, he had, had he fallen into Russian hands, he would have proven invaluable to them. Over the following weeks, teams of Soviet soldiers sped through Germany on an Alsos-style mission of their own. They were under orders to grab important papers from German labs and capture top German physicists. The Soviets wanted to know how far the German project had, bomb project had gotten, and they wanted German scientists, willing or not, to help them with their own bomb. As Soviet soldiers ransacked German labs, they realized two things. One, the Germans had not come close to building an atomic bomb. Two, all the scientists were gone. Land of Enchantment Harry Gold and Anatoly Yatskov sat at a small table in the back of Volk's Bar in Manhattan, talking over Gold's upcoming trip to New Mexico to meet with Klaus Fuchs. We discussed last-minute arrangements for the transfer of information once I got back from Santa Fe, Gold said. In case anything went wrong and either of them was unable to meet, Yatskov set up an emergency system. If Gold got two tickets to a sporting event in the mail, with nothing else in the envelope, he was to take note of the date on the tickets. Three days after the event, he was to go to a certain bar in Queens between 8 and 9 at night. He was to show up a little early, check for signs of surveillance, then take a seat. A Soviet agent would join him at the table. This was all routine to Gold by now, but then Yatskov hit him with an additional detail. He wanted me to take a little side trip, Gold remembered. He said there was a man in Albuquerque who also worked at Los Alamos and was ready to furnish with information. Gold didn't like it. I complained that it was jeopardizing the whole matter of the information I was getting from Fuchs, he said. It represented an additional delay, an additional period or interval in which something could happen. And I just for once got up on my hind legs and almost flatly refused to go to New Mexico. He was right to protest. A basic rule was being broken, KGB agent Alexander Fexelkoff later lamented, namely that two secret networks must remain compartmentalized without communicating between one another. The person having access to both networks becomes a weak link. If that person should stumble, both parts will fall together. Yatskov knew the rules of tradecraft, but his neck was on the line. He could not risk sending disinformation to Moscow. He wanted this second source as a backup to Fuchs's material. I've been guiding you idiots every step, he snapped at Gold. You don't realize how important this mission to Albuquerque is. Yatskov then gave Gold the name and address of the second source. $500 for the man, a password, and the torn half of a jello box. 
Adolf Hitler committed suicide on April 30th. Days later, Germany surrendered. The war in Europe was over. Scientists at Los Alamos celebrated and for a happy moment thought their job was done. Their work had been driven by the absolute necessity of winning the bomb race with Germany. For me, Hitler was the personification of evil and the primary justification for the atomic bomb work, remembered physicist Emilio Segre. Now that the bomb could not be used against the Nazis, doubts arose. Those doubts, even if they did not appear in official reports, were discussed in many private discussions. The discussions were cut short by a memo from Secretary of War Stimson, which Oppenheimer distributed in early May. The work you are doing is of tremendous importance and must go forward with all possible speed, Stimson urged. We still have the war against Japan to win. Only weeks before, the U.S. Marines had captured the Japanese island of Iwo Jima in some of the bloodiest fighting in the history of the American military, and the war would only get more ferocious as the Allies battled closer to the Japanese mainland. Pushing any doubts out of his mind, Oppenheimer worked his scientists harder than ever. The design for the uranium bomb was complete, and the plutonium bomb was nearly done. The next big question, was it necessary to test the atomic bomb to make sure it actually worked? The uranium bomb couldn't be tested. By July 1945, Los Alamos would have just enough U-235 for one bomb, and it couldn't be wasted on a test. But plutonium was a little easier to make, and the plutonium bomb design was far more complicated. Oppenheimer was convinced a test was essential. Leslie Groves disagreed. To test or not to test the plutonium bomb was a very hot issue, George Kistiliakoskai remembered. Oppenheim, Oppenheimer and I were pleading with General Groves that there had to be a test, because the whole scheme was so uncertain. But General Groves said he couldn't afford to lose all that plutonium. Oppenheimer won the argument by insisting that, without a test, the use of the gadget over enemy territory would have to be done substantially blindly. He selected a section of flat New Mexico desert near Alamogordo Air Force Base. He named the site Trinity. The test was set for mid-July. As the temperature soared over 100 degrees, scientists and soldiers moved into tents at the, at the test site. Each morning, they shook tarantulas and scorpions from their boots and tied handkerchiefs over their mouths in a hopeless effort to keep out the flying sand. They worked 24 hours a day, setting up instruments to measure the blast and building a 100-foot steel tower to hold the bomb. Robert Oppenheimer's younger brother, Frank, also a physicist, helped prepare for the test at Trinity. People were feverishly setting up wires all over the desert, he said, building the tower, building little huts in which to put cameras and house people at the time of the explosion. No one told Dorothy McKibben what was going on, but she was able to figure it out. More trucks than ever were rumbling past her Santa Fe office, more scientists checking in. And she kept getting calls from top government and military officials in Washington asking about hotel rooms in the area. The voices on the telephone showed strain and tautness, she said. I sensed we were about to reach some sort of climax. Harry Gold got to Santa Fe a little afternoon on June 2nd. With a few hours to kill before his meeting with Fuchs, he strolled through a local history museum. While there, he picked up a street map entitled New Mexico, Land of Enchantment. He checked the map for the spot where he was to meet Fuchs and marked it with a pen. He was glad not to have to ask directions, making it that much less likely that someone would remember he was ever in town. Later that afternoon, he walked to the Castillo Street Bridge, a gray arch over the narrow trickle called the Santa Fe River. Hardly more than a creek, Gold said to himself as he waited in the bright sun. He checked the watch of his sweaty wrist. It was 4.05 p.m. Fuchs should have been there five minutes ago. He looked around feeling conspicuous on the empty bridge. It was, he said, a place for a stranger, no place for a stranger to be standing around doing nothing. Standard Soviet trade craft was to wait no more than five minutes at a public meeting spot, and he longer could attract attention. But Gold had had to plead with his boss to get time off. He didn't know when he'd be able to make it back to New Mexico. He decided to wait a little longer. Finally, at 4.20, Fuchs's blue car pulled up, Gold ducked into the passenger seat, and Fuchs drove off. Fuchs apologized, saying he'd gotten a flat tire. Gold glanced over at the physicist. He was looking healthier. His usually pale skin had some color, and he put on a little weight. Fuchs stopped the car at a deserted spot. He gave Gold a quick update on the progress at Los Alamos and the upcoming test. They set their next meeting for September, as soon as Gold thought he could get away from work again. 
Then, Fuchs handed over what Gold described as a considerable packet of information. I did what I consider to be the worst I have ever done, Fuchs would say, Fuchs would say several years later, namely to give information about the principle of the design of the plutonium bomb. Gold climbed onto a bus with the plans for an atomic bomb in his travel bag. His head was pounding, and he wasn't sure if it was from stress or the altitude. Santa Fe is over 7,000 feet above sea level. When he got uh, to Albuquerque, Gold was told every hotel room in town was booked. He wandered for hours. Near midnight, in desperate need of rest, he asked a passing policeman where he could spend the night. The cop directed him to a rooming house where he was given a cot in the hall. He couldn't sleep. Every police siren, every drunken hoot, every sound that night triggered the same thought. They might be coming for me. The next morning, Gold walked to the address given to him by Anatoly Yatskov, entered the building, walked up to the second floor apartment, and knocked. The door was opened by a young man wearing army pants and a pajama shirt. He had curly black hair and a goofy grin. Mr. Greenglass? Gold asked. Yes. I come from Julius. Hearing this phrase, Greenglass turned back into the tiny apartment. He picked up his wife's purse and took out the torn half of a jello box. Gold took out his half of the jello box and handed it to Greenglass. Greenglass held the torn pieces together. They fit perfectly, clearly two halves of the same box. Gold stepped into the apartment and introduced himself to Greenglass and his wife as Dave from Pittsburgh. He asked for the package. Greenglass said it wasn't ready. He needed a few hours to write up his report. Gold sighed angrily. You know, Greenglass said, still smiling, there are several men at Los Alamos who might also be willing to furnish information. If you want me to, I can go right ahead and talk to them. The devil you can, Gold hissed, infuriated by the source's lack of tradecraft training. You don't approach people like that and say, say, can you give me information on the atomic bomb? Greenglass apologized, said he was just trying to help. Gold said he'd be back in a few hours. Exhausted and annoyed, he walked down the stairs muttering to himself, who in the world ever got this guy into, into this business? Does this poor baby know what the heck he is fooling with? Though Gold didn't know the details, David Greenglass was an army sergeant assigned to Los Alamos. He worked in a machine shop on the hill, helping to build the super precise explosive molds needed for the implosion bomb. Greenglass wasn't a scientist, and didn't know nearly as much about the bomb as Klaus Fuchs or Ted Hall. Still, his knowledge was useful, and the Soviets wanted every scrap of information they could get. Gold returned to Greenglass's apartment later that afternoon. Greenglass gave him an envelope containing about 10 pages of notes and rough sketches, and Gold handed the soldier $500 in cash. Gold traveled by train to Chicago, caught a plane to Washington, D.C., and jumped on a train up to New York City. From there, he took the subway to Queens and found his way to a deserted area near a cemetery. Anatoly Yatskov was there. We met for a matter of seconds, Gold recalled. I turned over the information. <laughs>